Hello and welcome to my channel, Vice Rhino here. Today I'm looking at a video asking what are the proofs of the resurrection of Jesus? Which is an excellent question that, as far as I'm aware, lacks a correspondingly excellent answer, with most answers being an appeal to documents written by non-eyewitnesses decades after the fact. So we'll see if this one does any better. But first, a word from our sponsor. Okay, sitting in my favorite coffee shop, ready to start writing my book. Let's go. Here's your tea, and here's your ball gag banana and a pack of matches. Wait, all I ordered was the tea. What's with all that other stuff? Well, you don't use Surfshark when you're connected to my router here at the coffee shop, so I'm able to see a log of all the websites that you visit while you're connected to my public Wi-Fi network. I've seen things that cannot be unseen. What's Surfshark? Surfshark is a VPN, or virtual private network. It keeps your data private by encrypting all the information sent between your device and the internet, meaning that if you had thought to use it, then I wouldn't be able to access even your most basic data, like which websites you keep visiting, keeping it private and secure. It's always a good idea to use VPN for some extra security, especially on public networks. Is that all it does? I mostly browse at home, so I generally don't have to worry about snoopy coffee shop owners like you. It can also be used to unblock geo-restricted content, allowing you to watch Netflix or other streaming services using a different country's library. And in addition to all that, their clean web feature blocks ads, trackers, malware, and phishing attempts, letting you browse the web safely and securely. That's a lot of features. Surely that must cost a fortune. Not at all. Vice Rhino viewers can pick it up with a special offer today by visiting my URL in the video description and using promo code RHINO at checkout, which will get them 83% off the regular price and three extra months for free. And this is all risk-free. It's backed by a 30-day money-back guarantee, so if you don't like it, you can get a full no-hassle refund. Okay, just one last question. You knew enough to bring out the ball gag banana and matches, so why didn't you also bring out the big- Sir, please, there are other customers here. I wouldn't bring that out in front of polite company. Surfshark, because we really don't want to know what you did with that banana. So what were the matches even for? Okay, so hear me out. First thing you do is you take the banana, put it in your mouth, then you keep it in there with the ball gag. Then you take the matches, you light one, and then you stick that... The word proofs is a loaded term in philosophy, and in many cases people will push back at us for using that in the Christian faith. Yep. Proof is a very high bar that is incredibly hard to meet, which is generally why I ask for evidence rather than proof. But I am also willing to not quibble about the definition of the word proof. If an apologist makes it clear that they are using it in a colloquial sense rather than an academic sense, then that's fine, I can accept that. But generally I avoid it myself in order to avoid this kind of confusion. But the Bible itself, Acts 1-3, says that with many convincing proofs, Jesus appeared to his disciples for 40 days after his resurrection. And that's another spot where I would tend to be somewhat forgiving. I doubt the author was using the word that is translated there as proofs in the same way that academics use it today, so I would be more than willing to interpret that as them just saying that Jesus provided lots of evidence to his disciples. Now, what that evidence is, is left mostly to the imagination. We can piece together what the author could have been referring to based on other accounts, but the author in this instance appears to have been attempting to write an account of events targeted at people who were already believing Christians, so it makes sense that he would leave out some of the details that might be used to try and convince non-believers, because they just aren't in his target audience. In fact, the apostles were faced with this accusation that they had actually stolen the body of Jesus. What's amusing to me here is that we know of this accusation because of the author of Matthew. He basically wrote an apologetic response to this accusation into his gospel. Matthew is the only gospel to mention the guard at the tomb, which is a strange detail to omit from the other gospels if it were indeed true. It also leaves us with some questions. A straight reading of Matthew 27, 62 to 66 leads us to believe that this is a Roman guard. The priests go to Pilate and ask him for a guard. He says, you have a guard, and then they go and guard the tomb. But when we get to the events following the resurrection, for some reason this guard, thought to be Roman, reports back to the chief priests rather than to Pilate, and these chief priests then tell them to lie to Pilate about what happened at the tomb. Moreover, the lie is that they fell asleep while on duty, so if they were a Roman guard, this is punishable by execution. 
Now, since the temple had a kind of guard of its own, and the guard at the tomb reported to the priests, it could be suggested that Pilate saying, you have a guard, wasn't him giving them a guard, but rather asking why they are coming to him instead of using their own. And so, as early as the New Testament, all the way to this present day, there have been attacks on the notion that Jesus was raised from the dead. And I mean, yeah? Do you really expect people to just accept that a dude was raised from the dead with full credulity? Don't bother answering that. We both know that the answer is yes, but that you can't come right out and say it. Through the next almost 2,000 years, if we were to come up to today, there are a series of what we call counter theories to the resurrection. Yes, there are a number of them, but while I think they are fun thought experiments, ultimately we don't need them. You are claiming that a guy came back from the dead. If you expect me to believe it, you have to give me evidence for it. I have seen what apparently counts as evidence from apologists, and so far I am not impressed. I don't need to explain why I don't believe such an outlandish claim. If you expect to convince me, you need to bring something to the table in order to accomplish that. A refutation of possible naturalistic explanations is not something that you even need to consider until such a time as you have some sort of compelling evidence to support your position. Absent such evidence, all I have to do is say, I don't believe you, when you say that Jesus rose from the dead, much as you might be inclined to say to me if I explained to you that I was hiding a zombie horde in my basement. The resurrection of Jesus through the centuries has responded to these counter theories, such as, well, his body was stolen, or maybe he wasn't really dead when he was put in the tomb, and so on. Personally, my favorite is the one that conservative scholars, who try really hard to push for the resurrection as being a true historically verifiable event, like Gary Habermas, will sheepishly admit is a possibility. That would be that Jesus' body was thrown in a mass grave, or maybe an unmarked grave if he were lucky, and as such, nobody really knew where he was, and likely wouldn't have been able to identify his body if they did. Prob most probably, Jesus' body would have been thrown into a mass grave. So my question is, what is the earliest historical evidence we have of Jews being thrown, criminals being thrown into a mass grave? Does it come at the time of Nero, around 70 AD, or does it come before then? Because it seems to me like that's the earliest evidence that we have of these mass graves. Okay, first of all, you're going to be hard put to, to nail exact historical references when it was done, but I would concede, and many would, that that's what happened to most people, not necessarily mass graves, but a little, a little classier would be a rectangular square in the ground, like today only without a casket. Have been responded to powerfully such that I'm convinced today the very best answer is in fact rationally that Jesus was historically raised from the dead. That's not how that works though. That essentially breaks down to the God of the gaps. If I can't explain how we got the story as reported in the Gospels in naturalistic terms, then it must have been a miracle. It's an argument that not only smuggles in the historical reliability of the Gospels, something which is definitely in question, but it assumes that we even know enough about this event to say with any amount of certainty exactly what happened. Now some of the actual historical evidences that have been discussed through the centuries are that Jesus was really dead. That is to say, there's no question that he just swooned when he was put into the tomb. The Romans knew how to kill you when they crucified you. I am not aware of anyone who disputes that who doesn't do so because they're relying on the truth claims of a different and competing holy book. Unless you count the mythicists who don't think he was alive in the first place and so wouldn't have died by crucifixion because, you know, you can't crucify someone who didn't exist. Two, the fact is that his tomb was empty. Where'd you get that from? We haven't even established that he even got a tomb burial to begin with. The earliest accounts of Jesus' burial, written by Paul, make no mention of a tomb. Now, certainly this does not mean that he did not get a tomb burial, but given that the first account of a tomb burial wasn't written until about two decades after his death at the earliest, this should give us pause. In all of Paul's writings, his encounters with Jesus are described as revelations and visions, not physical encounters. Combine this with the lack of a mention of a tomb of any sort, and the fact that most crucifixion victims were disposed of unceremoniously in an unmarked or a mass grave, and it seems like the most likely outcome for Jesus was that he was also disposed of in an unmarked or mass grave. 
The early Christians even lost where the actual tomb is. We don't know for sure even where you're taken as a tourist today is actually where he was buried. And this is supposed to be an argument in favor of him actually having been put in a tomb? The fact that we don't even have a tomb to point to as his somehow proves that he was in a tomb? Okay, if you say so, but you can see how that's not convincing, right? Why? Because they didn't care about it. He was raised from the dead. His enemies would have presented his body were he actually still in the tomb. So the reason we don't know where his tomb was is because nobody cared about the tomb once he was raised from the dead, so they didn't keep track of it. Which then leaves us with the question, why do so many people care so deeply about where his tomb is today? Why does that matter? He was raised from the dead. The same logic applies here. And yet, as you mentioned, people are constantly making pilgrimages to Jerusalem to see one of the three purported tombs of Jesus. Those are just the three in Jerusalem. There's another one in India and one in Japan. People care enough to save up money for years for the once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to visit these sites. But the people alive at the time the miraculous event took place just for some reason didn't care about it at all? Three, his disciples believed that they were seeing Jesus after his resurrection, that is in a post-mortem raised state, so much so that they were willing to die for this. This is remarkable. It's not really all that remarkable when you look at the details. We only have writings from one person who themselves claims to have seen Jesus, and that was Paul. Paul described his encounter in a way that makes it pretty much crystal clear that it's a non-corporeal vision of Jesus, and he talks about receiving the teachings that he is passing on through revelation, not through conversation with a normal dude. As to the fates of the disciples, we don't actually know anything about them. Church tradition has most of them being martyred, but most of these traditions are of uncertain origin and come from apocryphal books that are considered to be completely unreliable for everything except the martyrdom accounts, for reasons. All that's really required to end up where we are with Christianity is for one or two of the disciples to have had a bereavement hallucination that they were convinced was actually Jesus. And I am really coming to understand just how easy that could have been. On more than one occasion, I have dreamt that Mrs. Rhino was somehow still alive, and upon waking, the feeling that she was coming back lingered for a lot longer than I would have ever expected before experiencing something like this myself, to the point where I have found myself mentally preparing to call all the banks and insurance people to try and explain why I sent a death certificate to them for someone who's still alive. If I had superstitious tendencies and were prone to thinking my dreams had some sort of meaning, I might well be convinced that this is a form of communication from beyond the grave, and I can easily see how that could turn into a story of a resurrection, especially for someone who apparently taught that he would, at some point, be resurrected. And in fact, they changed for their belief system. These early believers were Jewish, and so they began to worship on the first day of the week, that is, Sunday, instead of uh, the Sabbath day. Not at first. The split of Christianity from Judaism was a long, slow process that took about a century to complete. Now, Christianity was very sectarian in its beginnings, arguably more so than today, so it is possible that there were some who changed the day of worship immediately, but that was not universally the case. In fact, many Christians still worshipped normally in the synagogues until they were expelled sometime after the destruction of the temple in 70 CE. My point is that it was a slow, gradual process. It wasn't an immediate, like, oh, we're Christians now, he raised on Sunday, so we worship on Sunday. They, had, they celebrated the Lord's Supper, which is a proclamation of his death and burial and resurrection until he comes. So early Christians believed Christian things. It's not really surprising. Also, I had to rewind the video just now, and I pressed play partway through the word resurrection there, so it sounded for all the world like he said, erection until he comes. Erection until he comes? I mean, with phrasing like that, I can't not comment on it, but that was just a nice little bonus on top. On the tip. It was a tip. Just the tip? There's a tip joke in here somewhere. The tip is in here somewhere. I found it. And baptism, which was a symbol of buried with him in the likeness of his death and raised in the likeness of his resurrection. So is that why John the Baptist, arguably the inventor of baptism, was running around baptizing people before Jesus even began his ministry or anyone even knew who he was? But the real question here is, if John was baptizing people, 
Did he say we baptize you or I baptize you when he did his dunking? Because apparently that's enough of a distinction to cause a priest to have to resign in shame after learning that he had baptized thousands of people with the wrong words, possibly causing some marriages to be invalidated by the church, and causing others to lose their salvation because baptism is a requirement of salvation. And the church takes these magic words, said as the magic potion is poured on the baby's head, much more seriously than they take allegations of sexual assault from these same children when they're a little bit older. But that's a tangent. Back on topic. Interestingly enough, the various theories like swoon or conspiracy or they lost the body and so on, only a handful of these are still used today by skeptics. You barely listed enough to count as a handful to begin with, but you made it sound like their number is dropping from what you started with to just a handful. But all of those, except maybe swoon theory, are perfectly valid naturalistic alternatives that do a much better job of explaining the data than an actual resurrection. And actually, even swoon theory is better than magic, but I'm not going to go out of my way to defend it other than to point out that when studying history, the way we figure out which events happened in which way is by using probability. There are a number of factors to take into consideration, and I'm not going to go into them right now, but what it essentially breaks down to is that a natural event will always be more probable than a miracle, because a miracle is definitionally improbable. If miracles were just a normal part of everyday life, they wouldn't be miraculous. It'd just be how the world works. But since a defining characteristic of an event that is considered to be miraculous is just how improbable it would be for that event to happen, one might even go so far as to say impossible, then historically speaking, we can never say that we have verified a miracle from history, because writing a story about an impossible thing happening will always be way more probable than the impossible thing actually happening, no matter what natural phenomena went into making the author choose to write about the miracle. And the irony is they fail miserably simply to deal with what now the majority of New Testament scholars, even those who are not Christians, agree on those historical facts that I presented. Yeah, I can tell from this list that you're working from Gary Habermas' minimal facts argument. Unfortunately for you, in the more recent iterations, some of the more important facts have been removed from the list, as too many scholars have doubts as to their authenticity. The modern list of six facts essentially breaks down to Jesus died by crucifixion, some of his disciples had experiences that they interpreted as being a risen Jesus, which caused them to make some major life changes, Christianity arose fairly early after the death of Jesus, and Paul and James converted to Christianity. They're essentially minimal expectations for anyone who wants to start a resurrection-based religion. The bottom line is the significance of the resurrection of Jesus is intensely personal. The reason is simply that if he's not raised from the dead, then Christianity is silly. On that we can agree. There's no forgiveness for our sins. There's not even any sins. Can't be sins if there's no God to sin against. My having lived my life believing that he's raised from the dead was a waste. I could have lived it any other of a number of ways. Well, that's actually one of the reasons I think a lot of people go through the angry atheist phase. It feels like you've wasted so much of your life devoting yourself to something that isn't even real. And yeah, that sucks. There are plenty of things that I would have done differently had I been an atheist from a younger age. Now, that said, there's also a lot that I would not have done differently. I can't honestly say that my life would look much different than it does now if I were an atheist when I was younger. But eventually, most atheists do get past their angry atheist phase as realizing that staying mad at the past won't change anything. So it's best not to waste the one life we get being mad at something that we can't change. Instead, let's work to change the future for the better. Not everyone gets to that point, and there is definitely something to be said for staying angry at religious institutions that are actively trying to halt or even reverse progress. That kind of anger definitely has its place, but when speaking person to person, it's best to leave the anger behind. But if he is raised from the dead, then in fact, the hundreds of millions of people who've trusted in him through the centuries really do have hope for eternal life. Okay, but to flip that on its head, if Christianity is true and he really did raise from the dead, then that means there is zero hope for the tens of billions of people who have existed who have not been Christian. The vast majority of people to have ever existed have not known Jesus, and so according to most versions of Christian theology, are burning in hell, along with my aforementioned deceased wife. I remember 43 years ago when I was not a Christian, 20-year-old pagan, hated Christianity, yet woke up on Easter morning 
With a bad hangover as a hippie with long hair, God has a sense of humor, it seems. I'm not sure what's supposed to be funny about that. I mean, at least you're taking the road less traveled and having been a pagan rather than an atheist, so kudos for being a little tiny bit different, I guess? I had been told recently by Christians that on Easter, that was the day they celebrated Jesus having been raised from the dead. Oh, is it funny because your hangover made you feel like you were dead? Sure, why not? Let's go with that. At least it's humor adjacent. And the fundamental con question of life that I was facing, like, is there a God and could I be forgiven for the evil that I actually was fully caught up in and was convinced I was guilty of, Really, when it comes down to it, if you are convinced that it was evil, then why were you doing it? Could I be forgiven? I didn't connect all those dots, but something bothered me that morning. You can't have grown up in the United States if you got to that point in your life and weren't already aware of the saving grace of Jesus Christ, who washes away your sins with his blood. Because that's not creepy sounding at all. But that message is everywhere. And that's basically it for this one. Today's comment of the day comes to us from Eriaus Marx, who says, Wonder how many YouTube vids it would take to get an honorary degree in evolutionary biology. Well, you'd have to get a lot deeper into the weeds than I do in order for that to happen. So in my case, unless I start making content that will end up being extremely boring to the majority of my audience, the answer is infinity. Thanks for watching. Special thanks as always to my patrons, iOS Tilt Bill Gamer, Bryn Pound, Clench Eastwood, Lynn Dobbs, Mark McManus, Mark Hetchum, and all the rest, who are the early Christians losing the tomb that is my channel. If you'd like my absence to be proof of my presence, you can join us on Patreon for as little as a dollar per week over at patreon.com slash vice rhino. Don't forget to check out Surfshark by using the link in the description, and if you feel so inclined, you can also support the channel through direct donation or my Amazon wishlist. Links to social media, all the ways to support the channel, and to my other projects can be found at links.com. ViceRhino.com. If for whatever reason you want to send me stuff, my P.O. Box address is in the description. See you next time!